Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on Integrated Pest Management in Organic Field Crops, presented by Christine Mason, Eileen Cohen, and Robin Mittenthal. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find information about upcoming webinars as well as articles and videos on organic farming on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our website along with other archived webinars on organic farming practice. We're excited to present Christine Mason, Eileen Cullen, and Robin Mittenthal with us online today from Wisconsin. Christine Mason is the farm manager at Standard Process Certified Organic Farm in Palmyra, Wisconsin, secretary of the Wisconsin Organic Advisory Council, and a certified crop advisor. Christine and her husband, along with their daughter, are the fifth generation on their family farm in Palmyra, Wisconsin, growing organic corn, soybeans, wheat, and forages. Eileen Cullen is the Associate Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Entomology Department. She's also the UW ex the University of Wisconsin Extension State Specialist for Field and Forage Crop Entomology, focusing on integrated pest management. Robin Mittenthal has worked on organic farms, taught high school science, and is now completing his doctorate in entomology at the University of Wisconsin with a focus on connections between soil fertility, plant health, and insect responses. After their 45-minute presentation, you'll have the chance to ask some questions. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, you can simply type it into the question box on your screen and hit return. If you don't see the question box, click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel to open it up. We'll read the questions out loud and answer as many as we have time for in the 30-minute question period following the presentation. Because we have a large number of people registered, not everyone may get their questions answered, but we'll give you some resources if you have additional questions after the webinar. So now I'm going to hand over the stream, screen control to our very first speaker, Christine Mason. Christine, um, when I give that to you, it'll take about a second, and then you can just click on your screen once to activate the control. Okay. All right. Well, hello. I'm Christine Mason, and I am the um, farm manager for Standard Process Farm. And Standard Process is a nutraceutical company, so we grow a lot of organic vegetables, and then we process those vegetables into um, whole food supplements. And so that's kind of what Standard Process is all about. Um, it's myself and these seven nice gentlemen um, growing you did. about 460 acres of cropland. Um, I think one of our richest resources um, is honestly our soil. We have really beautiful soil at the Standard Process Farm. Um, it's a low, flat farm. Um, mostly Martinton soils are organic matters go anywhere from 3 to um, 40 percent. And um, this farm, I think one of our big advantages too with this soil is it's been actively managed in organics for about 18 years. So we have a really um, incredible soil fauna and um, lots of good soil activity going for us. So I, thir I think it's certainly an advantage over a farm that's recently transitioned. Um, one of the things I think our chief um, integrated pest management strategy at Standard Process is we are just very adamant about extensive rotation. We have 21 um, separate vegetable crops and so at work I find it's a lot more um, convenient to rotate, obviously, than when you're just a grain farmer, but having 21 different um, goals allows us to never have um, the same crop family on the same soil for at least five years. Um, I threw this picture in. Um, we do grow row crops at work, and mainly just to rotate away from our vegetable production. Um, if we grow some soybeans or some corn, obviously, um, it breaks up our red beet or radish cycle. And I'm about 5'9". I threw this slide in um, to show how nice our oats were last year. Um, we very often have oats, you know, in the 90 plus bushel range and our row crop yields are very competitive. So whenever people say we can't feed the world this way, I say, come on over. This is a field of soybeans last year and Going back to the soil, I think that's what allows us to have these incredible nodules on our legumes and um, allows us to really feed nitrogen back into the soil. 
We are very religious at work about utilizing cover crops, and I try very hard to um, use cover crops from three different families. So in this picture, I have chickling vetch and barley and buckwheat. We let the um, cover crops get between our knee and our hip, and then we rotivate them in with a rotivator. Um, the organic standards are so strict for raw manure, and everything at standard process can be a food and end up in a vitamin. So even barley or oats or alfalfa, which would typically be animal feed, um, is for human consumption. And so we don't use raw manure at standard process. We try to grow our nitrogen with these cover crops. And um, we've very, been very successful at maintaining our organic matter. And the, the, the tilt of the soil is very healthy. I think one thing um, that helps us out a lot, both at work and at home, is if we can, the legume and the grass I use in these cover crops, we try to combine and keep ourselves. So the chickling vetch, we often combine um, the barley or the oats or from our <clears throat> um, oat production, excuse me, as well as the buckwheat. So cover crops can get quite expensive, but that's one way that we keep this um, very viable. And the nice thing about vegetables is they're shorter season crops, so we um, utilize a cover crop on every acre every year. I think one thing that helps us a lot with um, attracting beneficials is that between the cover crops and 21 different vegetables, we always have something blooming. So um, we successively plant all these different crops, and there's really no time you can come to the farm when um, much of it's not in bloom. So that helps me, I think, attract a lot of beneficials. We have um, never had an issue with pollinators, which I know um, pollination in honeybees is getting to be a very serious issue in some places. But I think this extensive um, variety of crops and planting dates really helps us with both the beneficial insects and the um, pollination. So one thing we do at Standard Process is if it's possible, we plant when it's cold. For um, sweet peas and the spring radish, if possible, we will get out there yet this week or the first week of April. And I think that it's just so darn cold in Wisconsin that if we can use the cold weather and get a jump on some of the weeds as well as some of the insects, um, that's certainly one of our key strategies. This alfalfa is way too mature, but I thought it was a pretty picture, so I threw it in. And for leafhopper, we grow a lot of alfalfa like um, most Wisconsin people. For leafhopper, we really um, we sweep and we look at pressure levels and we use cutting as our strategy. So um, we will just adjust our uh, harvest time depending on the um, insect pressure. I think for me, crucifers are one of the toughest vegetables because of the cabbage worms. And we um, just planted two weeks ago, we have about 80,000 crucifers in our greenhouse. We'll start about five acres of Russell sprouts and kale. One thing we did is we, you can see in the bottom right corner, we did a five-year replicated trial. And we found out that um, you can see the cabbages, or the, I'm sorry, the kales in front have much more extensive um, insect pressure wormholes than the cabbage in the back. And so we have landed on this red ursa kale that we go to. And we found that if it had a little color and a little ruffle in the leaf, um, this kale is ready for harvest. So it's just over two feet tall. And you can see there's no um, insect pressure in this field. It's probably about three acres of kale. So we found if we could, um, the variety selection was just absolutely essential to us for growing crucifers. The other challenge I find um, in the vegetable market is the pumpkins that we grow with um, cucumber beetle. We um, are very lucky in that on 460 acres, we only need about four acres of squash and pumpkins. So the number one strategy we found that we just uh, absolutely live by is that we only plant on ground that's never had a pumpkin. When and um, then 
starting three years ago, we started using these Hubbard squash as a trap crop. And we plant them around the perimeter of the field. And we've just had tremendous success with these Hubbard squash. The, we can hand spray as a last defense, but we haven't had to the last several years. Um, we do have very extensive bird and bat houses all around the farm, and we have a lot of waterways, so we attract these tree swallows, which do an awesome job for us. For weed control, we start as small as possible and disturb as little soil as we can. So we use a lot this veggie weeder. We do do some hand hoeing. Um, when the vegetables are very small, we go to this um, LSG. And um, I'm pretty sure the guy on the tractor is as big as the tractor. But you can see from my finger, um, we start very small. We use these small tractors and disturb as little soil as possible. And it seems to do a really good job for us. Hmm. I must be done. Oh, no, I'm not. Um, last year, we. Um, Got about six and a half million pounds of vegetables off of the standard process farm out of these 21 harvest schools. And um, this is just another picture of kind of what we do. We start with the seed, and then we'll end up with a supplement in the bottle. OK, well, thank you, Christine. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning for some um, on the Pacific Coast. Um, this is Eileen Cullen, and I'd just like to follow up and sort of um, take um, up where Christine left off. And um, I'll be, I, I titled the presentation, as you see, an insect's eye view of organic field and forage crop systems. So I'll be switching gears a little bit, but you'll be seeing that I'll, I'll be talking a lot about the principles of IPM that Christine shared in her experience at her home farm and then primarily at Standard Process Organic Farm. So an insect's eye view. And the insect that I'll be talking today about, and you'll see in a minute, I'm using um, something we might not think about a lot, but I'm using the seed corn maggot as an example of this. But before I get to that, I just wanted to kind of um, reiterate a couple of points that Christine made. When we look at the National Organic Program Standard, and you can see the section that I have up here on the slide, this is actually taken out of the, the NOP rule for insect management. And certainly, we're looking at um, an IPM approach, really, for insect pest management in certified organic production. Growers are relying, as you well know, first on many of the things that Christine talked about, crop rotation, soil and crop nutrient management practices, sanitation, uh, you know, removing overwintering um, you know, um, sources. So for example, in orchards, you can remove old nut holes from the orchard floor. Um, crop and nutrient management practices, something that uh, Robin Mittenthal will talk about after my presentation. Biological control, natural enemy habitat, enhancement methods. And only when a combination of these approaches are, are not you know, satisfactorily um, suppressing insect pests, then a grower can work with his or her certifier to um, uh, seek you know, approval for a, um, organically compliant, organic compliant pesticide to be applied. But these are really the primary methods. And they fit within this concept of the IPM continuum, which um, in different uh, plant science disciplines, I think entomologists talk a little bit more about this. But it certainly can be um, applied to insect management, diseases, weeds, nematodes. Um, from the insect side, you can see it's kind of a, looks like a linear approach. Um, on one side, uh, at, the, at the lower left, um, more of a scouting-based economic threshold uh, type of a system. So a little bit more of a prescriptive or reactive um, kind of approach to managing insect pests. So in other words, when they get to a certain level that's economically you know, equivalent to cost of application and crop damage with yield loss, you know, a suppressive or an insecticide is applied. As you move along that IPM continuum, you can see it's going more towards the biointensive approach. And that can move up through still using economic thresholds, but using reduced risk pesticides. But then moving into many of the things that Christine covered so well, prevention, and really ecologically based tactics and strategies. And any farming system can have this IPM continuum. But um, you know, along the biointensive side, when you're in that realm of the IPM continuum, there can be it's, uh, less intervention that's necessary. And really, a, a relevant starting point for organic management is 
along that, that area of the IPM continuum. So with that in mind, this next slide just shows, again, a few of the things that Christine talked about. But in crop rotation, uh, many people are you know, probably very well familiar with that rotating crops can um, disrupt insect life cycles. In organic production systems, certainly with vegetables, you can have a, a long rotation. As Christine mentioned, in grain crops, it can be you know, uh, maybe a, a little um, you know, fewer crops, but still corn, soybeans, a couple of years of alfalfa. There's wheat. Um, you know, some growers that, that I uh, work with in my program, organic producers, have worked with other grains, different small grains, uh, experimented with spelt and different crops. So again, just that idea that um, a longer rotation, so four years before a crop is back in the, in the same ground. Um, but that's a crop rotation. Cover crops, building soil organic matter, nitrogen fixation, soil tilth, water holding uh, capacity, and weed suppression. All these things, again, are a farming system contributing towards uh, pest management. Planting data is one that I'll talk about in my little example here today with sea corn maggot. But planting around an insect's life uh, cycle when it's doing its feeding to a damaging, you know, the, the stage of the crop that can be damaged, as you'll see in a minute. Harvest date, Christine mentioned that. Um, with their alfalfa management, they, they will still sweep potato leaf hoppers. For example, as, as we do in conventional systems, she'll take account. And then uh, they will uh, manage their, their cutting date uh, around those leafhopper populations. Cultivation and tillage are certainly um, a big part of weed management in many systems. Um, but really also, this is cultivation and tillage is a part of cover crop incorporation. Um, or for example, rolling winter rye um, you know, before, before a row crop planting. Christine mentioned the Hubbard squash and the kale varieties. They've seen some, some real results and you know, gone towards pest resistant or tolerant plants, as they've seen on their farm. And then, as I mentioned, foliar sprays, um, for example, a microbial preparation of Bt, and there's some other products, if effective and economical so as a part of that, as a last resort. So, the little example that I have for you today is a sea corn maggot, and this is a crop that um, crops affected. I'll focus on corn and soybeans today, which is the work that I've uh, done in organic systems with this pest, but certainly it affects vegetables as well. Um, the crop stage, as you can imagine by its name, seed corn maggot, germinating seeds and young seedlings. So this damage is really taking place below ground. You can see the little seed corn maggot here. I'm pointing to it here. This is a destroyed germ uh, of corn, and this is a what we call a snakehead, a soybean seedling that the, the cotyledons, the seed leaves, have been eaten off. This little plant, uh, picture here is the pupa of the sea corn maggot. Sea corn maggot overwinters in the soil as this pupal stage, and that will be important in a moment. But that's how it overwinters. So that's basically um, how it, it is in the soil, just coming out of this stage soon here in Wisconsin in the upper Midwest. Damage symptoms are seen here, and really, um, you know, um, planting conditions, warm, dry soils, anything that will allow the seed um, to, to germinate and get past this seed corn maggot, if the seed corn maggot is below ground with the seed, can help to avoid damage. But of course, with weather conditions, you don't always have, growers don't always have, you know, hot, warm, dry uh, seed bed conditions. And you can have cold, moist soils, uh, possibly some soil crusting that can keep those seeds below ground for a little bit too long um, and be exposed to sea corn maggot larval feeding damage below ground. So that's the insect example. And as far as an insect's eye view, I just kind of wanted to use the sea corn maggot as an example. So why is the sea corn maggot a concern for organic growers? And it's a concern, um, it can be a concern for, for you know, growers in different systems, but particularly in organic. Um, we have a lot of um, you know, the cropping system practices, incorporation of living green cover crops. Here's a nice picture of a legume crop from Christine, um, a picture from one of the um, uh, 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 R&G Miller, Jim Miller, one of the farmers that we collaborate with, and he's rolling winter rye that you see here. So this incorporation of living green cover crops. Um, and sea corn maggot is attracted. The adult flies, when they come out of that pupil stage, they are attracted to decomposing organic matter this decomposing plant material, green plant material. So these cover crops can be very attractive to the sea corn maggot flies when, they've, um, when they're uh, flying and after, recently after plowing. So in this regard, thinking again about that IPM continuum, seed treatments apply to the seed. You know, that's really not uh, an option in an organic system that could kind of be thought about along that IPM continuum as, 
you know, pesticide replacement. Well, if there was an organically compliant seed treatment, maybe that could just be replaced. But we really don't look at it that way. So it's um, really planting the seed um, after cover crop incorporation. Again, we're talking here about corn and soybean. And you'll see that the reliance on monitoring of the fly's life cycle and degree days is really the primary cultural control. And it gets back to the idea of doing, uh, having this awareness of the relationship between this pest and how it fits into the organic cropping system. It's very attracted to decomposing organic matter. So this is a bit time and knowledge intensive, as you'll see. But um, having that knowledge can really help farmers determine when they're plowing in a cover crop. And then when they're planting their seed, I'm going to show you here very briefly um, how you can know what the seed corn maggot is doing and what life stage it's in, and if you're at risk, and how to minimize that risk of having your seeds, germinating seeds, um, there um, with the sea corn maggot. So this gets to the concept of calculating insect degree days, which I think is a term that we know as, is used a lot. It's used in crop development as well, you know, growing degree days. is, For example, what um, we'll talk about, farmers will talk about and others um, around corn or soybean development. With insect development, it's similar, um, but it's based on the idea that, you know, insects are cold-blooded. So they're going to be responding, of course, developing more quickly under warmer conditions and more slowly under cooler conditions within an optimal temperature range. And insects, depending on the species, so all different insects have a lower developmental threshold. And that's simply a temperature below which no real development occurs. They just kind of sit tight. And as long as it's not too cold or freezing to kill the insect, they're just going to kind of wait there. And then as heat units accumulate, they'll start developing. For seed corn maggot, that lower developmental threshold is 39 degrees Fahrenheit. I have it also here in Celsius, but 3.9 degrees Celsius, so 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And there is a process accumulating degree days. That daily accumulation is simply taking for each day. Um, you'll see in a moment here from January 1st, um, the daily low temperature and the daily high temperature in a given day, and just averaging that and then taking the difference of that average daily temperature and the base temperature. And any difference that's positive is an accumulated heat unit. So it's not a 24-hour day, uh, calendar day, but these are degree days. So those are heat units. As the insect accumulates them day by day, they're going to start that development out of that pupa in the soil and then um, through into their uh, adult fly emergence, which is going to be key for us when we think about peak fly emergence and when we're plowing in cover crops and when growers are planting these row crops. So um, in today's talk, we don't talk, we don't go into great detail on how to accumulate, but I think I've kind of explained it fairly thoroughly in the last slide, and I just want to direct you to my website here. We have, and this is a little schema, schema or schematic drawing here from the website, um, but we do have some detailed information on how you can accumulate degree days. And again, there's that daily degree days as a function of you could just take your average daily temperature, subtract the base temperature. Anything positive is a degree day that's accumulated toward that insect's development. Early in the spring, if it's um, a, a zero, if it's too cold, you just, you know, the, the insect hasn't accumulated degree days for that particular day. But you can check out this website. The website here also provides weather station data. Again, all this data comes from air temperature collected from weather station data. So and again, many people are familiar with this for other crops and other insects. The reason it's important here with the insect degree days for seed corn maggot is, again, we're looking at this progression through this insect's life cycle. It's just so important to have some knowledge about the timing of cover crop incorporation. We know that decomposing organic matter is going to be attracted to the flies. And trying to just time the best we can, you know, of course, there's weather conditions, labor, um, there's many other things on a farm, of course, that growers are managing and coordinating, you know, of course, other than just the sea corn maggot's life cycle. But I hope you'll see from this presentation that that knowledge can be helpful to see, well, when we do put that seed in the ground after cover crop incorporation, well, what can we expect? Do we have larva feeding, uh, eggs hatching, or are we into the overwintering or the, the next pupil stage? There are three or four generations of sea corn maggot. So what you're seeing here is a, is a picture. Here we are in the winter obviously past January 1st, and it's been overwintering as a pupa. This is a sea corn maggot. This is a picture of the adult fly. And I've, I'm pointing here to peak emergence. 50% of the spring fly emergence takes place at about 342 degree days. So from January 1st, 
you can predict when the um, flies are active and laying eggs in the field uh, or in the area if they're present. And then you can, from that point, continue to accumulate degree days. Another 420 degree days will take this insect from peak emergence and egg laying through first generation pupil stage. So with that, hopefully you're seeing in this graphic that as you plant the crop, you can kind of think of it as, well, and many of the older extension uh, uh, recommendations for, for conventional crops and such, certainly, and for any cropping system, recommend that you don't uh, plow in a cover crop and plant right during peak emergence. Obviously, that's when you have the most flies flying and laying their eggs. Um, as you go past this, again, this takes about two and a half to three weeks to accumulate this additional 420 degree days. You can see the eggs will be laid. This is actually a picture under a microscope, but eggs are being laid in the field. There's that feeding larval stage. It's all below ground. There's three larval instars, so it's not something we can scout for. Um, this is basically once the damage has occurred, it's really done. Um, we don't have economic thresholds. It's all about knowing when the sea core maggot is at peak flight. 342 degree days, then accumulating more degree days, and you can see how close you're getting to that non-feeding pupil stage. So this can help growers to time their planting and know what risk they have for having the seed contact that seed core maggot. So before I finish up here, and there's, again, I just have a little circle that comes up to that important thing, kind of a take-home message. Um, you know, again, it's not always possible to wait all the way till this pupil stage, but certainly you want to be aware of peak flight in terms of plowing in and planting uh, uh, the seed right after that. So um, just to wrap that part up, um, we're looking, hopefully you've seen here, really just, you know, it's kind of a simple sort of old school thing, but I think uh, uh, that um, looking at the sea corn maggot life cycle to plant crops during that non-feeding pupil stage, this is kind of a classic IPM cultural control method of planting date to uh, plant outside the window of pest activity to the best degree possible, you know, on a farm where there's a lot of other logistics and, and weather and labor and equipment concerns as well. Um, and then setting that biofix, and that again is that peak adult emergence. You can do that from January 1st, as I showed in the last slide. There is some literature that we've reviewed, and you can also have a more sort of uh, back of the envelope kind of practical approach assuming that peak adult emergence takes place at the time of cover crop incorporation, and then accumulating degree days, another 420 degree days from there, um, that does take about two and a half weeks. So again, um, you know, on a more practical level, you can, if you can wait that long, but if you can't, just the knowledge of planting right during the peak flight can be, can be quite risky. Now, just to mention this last one, um, this whole project that I'm summarizing here in the, the last part, uh, the last few slides here, is a survey that we did with organic growers, and it's um, one of a lot of the extension uh, material that used to be uh, that we first started working with looked at sea corn maggot, and it recommended that growers use yellow pan traps filled with soapy water, setting them out around the perimeter of a field, and then trapping flies, identifying the flies, you know, filtering out these flies, and uh, determining peak adult emergence, and then. Um, trying to adjust planting data around that. And I tell you, um, as entomologists and a graduate student and I, we did this together, and it's actually really pretty complicated and complex, very time consuming. So I think what I hope that you'll gain from this presentation is that tracking degree days can be an easier way, and that knowledge of cover crop incorporation as an attractant to flies. Um, I really haven't met um, a, a lot of practitioners in the field that are actually running uh, pan traps. It's more of a research method. So with that, Caitlin Holm is a student that finished her master's degree recently with me in the agroecology program. And I'm going to end my presentation here with just a few slides on a survey that she did with organic farmers in Wisconsin that grow corn and soybeans and small grains. And she wanted to get some input on um, their awareness and if they have a perceived need for seed corn maggot extension materials for this relationship between cover crop incorporation and seed corn maggot cultural control. So she had a very good response rate, which we appreciate, 60% response rate, which is really good for surveys, and we have uh, really value that input. It's multiple choice and some open-ended questions. And this is what we learned. So um, only 15% of the organic farmer respondents had received any information about seed core maggot from extension. Um, again, if you think about um, conventional systems, uh, um, we have seed treatments in those systems. 
Um, and it's kind of almost become, in a lot of cases, not a non-issue. If you have a corn or soybean seed treatment, seed corn maggot becomes a non-issue. But you hopefully have seen here with in organic systems with cover crop incorporation, and it's it's really a, a cultural control that uh, is it can be quite needed. So, 52 percent said no, seed corn maggot is not a problem. 43 percent said also, well, we're actually not sure, and only six percent thought it was a problem. When we asked, and this is important because sort of knowing if you have the problem or not, again, this is all happening below ground. You can see that damping off and root rots, different soil pathogens can look, on the right, can look quite similar uh, to seed corn maggots on the left. And if you happen to dig up a, a seed or a little row of seeds that's not quite germinating, and if the maggot isn't there, you may not know what caused the damage. So um, knowing if you have the problem and what the problem is can be really important. And the seed corn maggot can also look a lot like other soil pests. I've got you know, the wire worm there on the right compared to the seed corn maggot. So what Caitlin looked at was what are the factors preventing the use of degree days. In the survey, we looked at the importance of degree days. And really, you can see time constraints and just seeking a better understanding of how to use degree days were really important to organic farmers in our survey. And um, of course, as I mentioned earlier, weather strains, weather constraints, factors preventing uh, waiting to plant till the seed corn maggot peak flight has emerged or passed, and it's gotten closer to entering that non-feeding pupil stage. Um, but hopefully, this this uh, knowledge can really help. Um, certainly, plowing in a cover crop and planting, this can give you a little more information instead of you know, um, you know, just knowing what the seed corn maggot life where where that insect pest is in its life stage and how your planting data is fitting around that can be important. The means of receiving information, it was interesting. The two things that were most important to organic farmers in this survey were learning from other organic farmers and farms. And this was actually a specific question, not um, necessarily research farms, but other farms, other organic farms that they're networked with. And surprisingly, 74%, just a, like I said before, kind of an old school or classic extension fact sheet, but geared towards organic management systems. So that's what we've tried to do here in the output of this uh, particular webinar. And uh, it will actually be um, an organic um, fact sheet on C-Core Maggot. And I'll be um, also um, submitting that to the eOrganic um, database as well online. But hopefully you've seen here as I close that organic system practices, um, there are some aspects of it, as you've seen, with cover crops that can and may increase attractiveness of fields to C-Core Maggot in the spring. Uh, we found only a small minority of growers have received information on seed corn maggot and organic systems. But they're interested in using degree day, de degree day techniques, really would like a better understanding and a real clear um, guide to how to use those in a very streamlined way. And the last slide here shows kind of our approach. Certainly, we're very grateful to be working with eOrganic and be invited to participate in this webinar today. And we're really tailoring this to grower needs. So if People would like to understand more about how to use degree day models. The fact sheet that's forthcoming has a detailed description, spreadsheet, weather station databases, and um, um, that can help with time constraints to make that easier. And it will have a lot of text and photographs, as you've seen here, too. So with that, I am going to turn the controls over to my colleague and our next presenter, Robin Missenthal. Hello, everyone. Uh, new voice here. This is Robin Mittenthal. Thank you very much, Christine and Eileen. And thank you to the eOrganic staff for setting this up today. Um, Eileen talked about a particular pest and the question of timing. I'm going to talk about, well, I have this complex sounding title here, Insect Response to Applied Nutrient Inputs in Organic Field Crop Production. As I thought about it, a better title might just be, Do Insects Respond to Fertilizers? Um, I'm going to talk about the topic in general briefly and then focus in on some research that I've been doing with Eileen and a group of growers, including Christine. And then we should have time for questions. So this is an understatement. Agricultural production involves a lot of complex interactions. Here I have some of what goes on in a farm. We have fertilizers put on soil. Um, and, and fertilizers don't always behave in soil the way that we expect them to. Um, soil interacts with plant roots in ways that are very complex. Plant roots and plant shoots interact as well in ways that are not necessarily straightforward. And if you look at interactions between plants and insect pests, this is supposed to be a group of soybean aphids here, um, those interactions are also very complicated, as are the interactions between pests and their predators. Here we have a ladybug feeding on soybean aphids. If you look at any two steps in this process, 
the interactions are complex enough, um, say fertilizer and soil, if you look at two, more than two or the whole system, then it becomes much, much harder to draw conclusions and recommend specific practices. So that's sort of a disclaimer at the beginning, I guess. Um, farmers could potentially take advantage of some of these interactions. If we could understand them better and harness them, they might be helpful with pest management, especially in systems without insecticides. Uh, Christine and Eileen have talked about rotation uh, and tools like resistant varieties that we know work for some pests in some situations. And so my question today is, what about fertility management choices? You know, N NPK, micronutrients, et cetera. Um, and I should back up and say, as you know, that um, for better and for worse, fertility management in terms of providing nutrients is especially in organic systems not separate from a whole lot of other things like mulching to suppress weeds or uh, many other practices. So organic is complicated. Let's start with a, a seemingly simple question. Um, are there fewer plant-eating insects present if you use organic fertilizers instead of synthetic ones? And I know this is an, an e-organic webinar, but this is, I think, a useful place to start. So if we, if we have an organic fertilizer like manure as our end source, instead of, say, urea or anhydrous ammonia, are there fewer plant-eating insects? Oops. There we go. I think. This is a surprisingly difficult question to answer. Let's say hypothetically that we do find more larvae in a plot that we've treated with anhydrous ammonia than in a plot treated with manure. Um, why might we find that? What I'm going to do is go through some of what researchers have either found or proposed to explain something like that. One possibility is that synthetically fertilized plants, so our, our anhydrous ammonia fertilized plants, have, something, have more of something that larvae need. Uh, one, one commonly explored possibility is nitrogen, that uh, if you're fertilizing with anhydrous ammonia, that's a really quick release, readily available form of nitrogen. Plants do take up a lot of it, and they potentially have a lot of nitrogen floating around in either mineral form or simple amino acids, and insects can detect that either when they're feeding or potentially when they're choosing plants to lay their eggs on. And so those synthetically fertilized plants have more of it than organically fertilized plants, and insects respond favorably. This is just the flip side of that. Maybe those organically fertilized plants have less free nitrogen, for example. You may have heard of the soil balance hypothesis, which says, among other things, that uh, because organic fertilizer or organic nutrient sources are generally slow release, um, there, are no, there are no spikes in nutrient availability from the soil that in turn cause spikes in nutrient content in the plant, and therefore there's nothing like a spike in nitrogen availability to which insects can respond. Um, another possibility is that synthetically fertilized plants make less of something that's harmful to larvae. You, you may know that plants make a lot of different defensive compounds, um, brassicas, ca cabbage and cauliflower, and uh, Brussels sprouts, for example, make compounds called glucosinolates. Um, corn makes a compound called dimboa when it's short, and uh, those compounds, production of those compounds in some cases is known to be nutrient dependent. In other cases, we really don't know, but it's possible. So the synthetically fertilized plants in this case might be making less of something like that. And again, the flip side, organically fertilized plants might make more of something that's harmful to larvae. It's also possible that both sets of plants are fine for the larvae to eat, but that something about the fertilizers affects egg laying. So the larvae do fine if, they're, if their eggs placed on a plant and they hatch, the larvae do fine. But the mothers making choices about where to lay their eggs somehow detected something about the fertilizers um, and laid eggs differentially between the two different sets of plots. It's also possible that both sets of plants are fine for the larvae to eat, but something about the organic fertilization supports predators that help to control larvae. Uh, one study that I read found that organic fertilization with manure uh, supported a larger community of nematodes, and those were fed on by beetles. And those beetles are generalist predators that also climbed up corn stalks and ate the eggs of moths, pest moths. So it was an unexpected, above-ground pest control benefit of 
fertilizing with manure. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of these points. They'll be in the, in the talk notes afterward and get to the most common result of studies like this, which is that when you repeat a trial in two different years or more than two years, or you repeat it with a different crop or a different insect, you don't see the same difference at all. Or you get a completely opposite result, or you get different results with different hybrids or fertilizer rates. And this is far and away the most common result. And so translated into a take-home message, it's very difficult to recommend specific practices, specific rates of fertilizer, specific materials to use um, if you want to reduce pest problems. They're just, we don't have that information yet. That's, a, again, the organic conventional comparison, and, and it's complicated. What if we want to compare two or more different organic fertility management methods? Uh, not much research has been done on that. I think if it is, when it is done, the results are likely to be equally variable. Um, and so I want to give you an example from my own work with Eileen and, again, a group of very helpful organic farmers across southern Wisconsin. And to do that, I need to give you just a little background on what's often called the base cation saturation ratio concept, or BCSR. You may find, as I explain it, that you know it by some other name. It's gone by lots of different names. And this has to do with uh, cation ratios in soil. You may know that soil contains both clay and organic matter, and the clay and organic matter both have on their surfaces negative charges which are capable of reversibly binding um, nutrient cations, particularly calcium, magnesium, and potassium. There was a group of soil scientists beginning, oh, in the 1890s through the 1940s who thought that they had found, identified an ideal ratio of these cations uh, on soil, clay, and organic matter. And the ratio that they came up with was uh, about 65% of those sites filled up with calcium, 10% with magnesium, 5% with potassium, and the rest with protons, or exchangeable acidity. And you see different ratios out there, but uh, most of them were around this. Um, subsequent research in the 50s and to the present um, people reevaluated a lot of that early work and found that those early researchers, when they made the soils that they made with particular ratios of calcium and magnesium in particular, that they didn't control for pH. So their results were in fact explained by pH, to which plants are very sensitive, and not by cation ratios. Later researchers found that plants would tolerate and in fact do very well at very different cation ratios. Um, so in lots of subsequent studies from 1950 through really almost today, um, people have not found an effect uh, on yield, but the idea is still really widely used, both by growers and by soil testing labs that are making recommendations to growers. Uh, it's probably not harmful to do this, except for costs of amendments. It does, if you want to achieve particular cation ratios, certainly in our case, it's been expensive to do that, um, to buy the calcium amendments it requires. Uh, there's been little investigation of the effects of this ratio concept on biological parameters like weeds and insects. Um, it may be that even though there are not big yield effects or crop quality effects, that there are some impacts elsewhere in the system, and so that's what we've focused on. So our core hypothesis or idea for testing is that insect pest populations are lower and, and or less variable at higher calcium to magnesium ratios. Um, in, in Wisconsin and much of the upper Midwest, if you're trying to achieve these ideal soils, that generally means that you're trying to increase the amount of calcium that's in the soil and decrease the amount of magnesium. Um, and you generally, if you, if, you try, if you do that, the potassium and other ions take care of themselves. We're also interested in predators, higher levels in the food chain, um, and in weeds, but the insects are the main focus. So our field experiment, um, we have two organic soil treatments, um, each with a four-year rotation. We're doing an, we have an alfalfa, alfalfa, corn, soybean rotation. The alfalfa in the first year is often established with a small grain like oats or wheat. And in one set of plots, uh, we're applying, we've applied a lot of calcium amendments, um, a little bit of ag lime and mostly gypsum, uh, and a total of about four and a half tons per acre, which is a lot. Both of them, by the way, are, are receiving manure as their main uh, NPK amendment. 
And we have four replicates or copies of each crop treatment pair in any given year. Um, we, this is, I am doing, talking now about an organic, organic comparison, but we did add conventional comparison plots after the first year. It's potentially useful to be able to say some things about um, how or if insects behave differently in organic and con conventional plots. And these are three-quarter acre plots, which is pretty big for agricultural experiments, um, located near Madison, Wisconsin, south, southeast Wisconsin, south central. Um, and we also have done a similar experiment on campus in the greenhouse. We're working with three pest moths, European corn borer, corn earworm, and western bean cutworm in corn, potato leaf hoppers in alfalfa, soybean aphids in soybeans, and also we're looking at um, pirate bugs, uh, ladybugs and uh, parasitic wasps um, as potential predators or parasitoids of soybean aphids. I need to speed up here to leave time for questions. But briefly, this is a snapshot from the air of our plots. The long ones are organic plots. The conventional comparison plots are over here on the side. Quite a pretty set of plots. And some selected results to date. On the left-hand side, these two bars represent the change in calcium to magnesium ratios from 2007 to 2010. And in a nutshell, what this shows is a significant increase um, in the amount of calcium relative to the amount of magnesium. So we pushed up our calcium levels a lot and got rid of a bunch of exchangeable magnesium. Um, we actually also did that in the plots, the organic plots, that did not receive calcium amendments. Um, the, the ratio of calcium to magnesium went up slightly there, too, significantly, in fact. Um, we, that might be because of drift of the very fine materials from adjacent treated plots. It might also be because both sets of plots are receiving manure, and manure has a fair bit of calcium in it, too. But we did have a much greater, uh, achieve a much greater change in cation ratios in the plots where we actually meant to do that. Um, let's see. Do we get my little sidebar up? Um, for some reason, not. But what I meant to have on the side here is uh, a comment to the effect that we have not ourselves seen a change in yields. Our yields have been essentially identical between the two sets of organic plots and the conventional plots. We also have, with very minor exceptions, not seen differences in tissue or grain quality. Um, our alfalfa plots fertilized with gypsum have had some higher sulfur, sulfur levels, which is perhaps reasonable given that we've been putting on a whole lot of calcium sulfate. But otherwise, we haven't seen differences so far. Let's see if I can get to our next slide here. Alice, I am not advancing here. Oh, there we go. Super. I just need to keep going down. Um, just a couple quick shots, snapshots of insect data from the trial. That's what it's mostly about for us entomology folks. Um, mean aphids per plot. This is aphid data from 2009. On the y-axis, we have aphid numbers. On the x-axis, we have the course of the aphid season from uh, throughout 2009. And for most of the season, aphid numbers are very, very low. And then in late July and early August, they shoot up. They end up highest in our conventional plots, next highest in our organic plots without calcium, and lowest in our organic plots with, calci with uh, calcium. And you might think from a take-home, what do I do on my farm perspective, that, that, that people would say, oh, OK, the thing to do is fertilize with calcium. Um, but if you look at variability, the curse of standard error bars, um, these error bars represent variability between plots and there turns out to be no statistical difference between these, these two organic treatments. On the last date, the conventional plots do have significantly higher numbers of aphids than either of the organic ones, but there's no significant difference between these two. If you look at the same set of data from 2010, aphid numbers were much lower, even by late in the season. They never went up about, above about 350 aphids whereas in 2009, we peaked at 1,500 to 2,000 aphids. In 2010, there wasn't even the, the non-significant difference that we had in 2009. There were the two organic sets of organic plots seemed were virtually indistinguishable in terms of aphid numbers. But again, on several dates, there was a difference between them and the conventional plots. Um, this is one of our predators of interest, the minute pirate bug. 
Here you can see the lines for the three treatments, conventional organic with calcium and organic without calcium. The lines appear maybe to separate out a little bit, but there's so much variability here that there's really no difference between them. And so, just to give you take-home messages, um, you can change cation ratios on a field scale. I had thought before we started this experiment that that wouldn't be possible based on what I had read about soil science. It does require a lot of inputs. Again, we've put on about four and a half tons per acre of ag lime and gypsum. So far, we haven't seen a significant insect or crop effect um, of this ratio approach in our organic, organic comparison. Uh, for soybean aphids, at least, we have seen populations, some, some lower populations in organic plots than in conventional plots. And if we have time and you have interest, we can talk during the question phase about why that might be. Um, I like to point out we're comparing only one narrowly defined set of organic practices, and we can't generalize to other fertilization practices in other production systems. And finally, once again, I said this already, but I'll say it again, I don't think there's enough evidence to recommend particular fertility management practices for pest control. You see people do this at trade shows, and I think they're selling something. Um, at this point, we don't know anything to recommend other than, and I put this in bold and italics, do regular soil testing and fertilize to maintain levels of nutrients sufficient to meet crop needs. Um, I used to be a farmer, and I think it's not unfair to generalize and say that a lot of farmers, organic and conventional alike, either don't test their soil at all or don't test it often enough to make sure that they're just taking care of their plants in the most basic way, um, which is at, at least helpful in terms of uh, preventing pest problems. So with that, I should stop. Um, and I think we're ready for questions. And I think the eOrganic staff, Alice, you're going to set that up? Chris? Yeah. Um, thank you, Robin, and also Christine and Eileen. Um, we're about to start our question and answer period for the next 30 minutes. Um, but before we do, we're going to launch a very quick 20-second poll with a question from Robin for the farmers in our audience. And I'll just open that up. Give me a moment. OK. Um, so if you could just fill that up, we'll have that quickly on your screen. If you're a farmer, do you aim for a certain ratio of calcium to magnesium in your soil? Um, Robin was wondering about your familiarity with this technique or use of it. Okay, so um, if everybody will just vote for another few seconds, we'll just close that, broadcast the results, and we will move on to our question and answer period. Okay, we're almost there. Okay. So let's see if I can share the results here. OK. Um, for anyone who missed the beginning of the presentation, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. If you don't see the question box, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question to open it up. And we'll read the questions out loud, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. Um, this webinar has been recorded, and it will be posted within the coming week on our website, along with the slides, um, under archive webinars on the eOrganic website. I'll pull that up in a moment. If after the webinar you have additional questions or questions that haven't been answered, um, we um, welcome you to use the online Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask, and you'll get an answer. Finally, we really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. So now let's move on. We're getting some questions in from the audience. Um, first question, this refers to Eileen's part of the presentation. Can phenology give us an idea of what else to watch for when the fly's active time, when the fly's active time is instead of using degree days if it's so confusing? I don't know. So as I understand it, the question um, is, can phenology degree day units give us an idea of another indicator? Um, yeah, it, what else to watch for when the fly's active time is? Oh, with regard to sea corn maggot. Oops. Do you think that's... Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, um, actually, this is what's interesting about or kind of challenging about the sea corn maggot. Um, we presented this workshop at the uh, Midwest Organic, um, the Sustainable um, Education Service uh, Organic Farming Conference in La Crosse. And one of the questions was asked, um, similar to this, was could we scout for seed corn maggot? Is there anything you can do to monitor the flies or, you know, without using the degree days? I think on one hand, and I, I like the question that was asked here, you know, because they're so confusing, 
on the one hand, I think degree days are, um, they can be, they're really detailed. And you can see that from my presentation. I kind of spent a fair amount of detail on it. They're, um, in some ways, not that complicated. But unfortunately, or fortunately, I mean, it's good to have the knowledge for this. But with CCOR Maggot, it's not a pest like I mentioned before, that we have economic thresholds for, um, even in a conventional system, for example, where a farmer, you know, again, this is something that once you notice that the sea corn maggot, you know, once you notice the seeds are not germinating, coming out of the ground, the damage is done. Um, and it's kind of cryptic. So the sea corn maggot is very small. Um, sometimes, now we have been in fields, uh, the best I can say to this of other indicators, um, I have been in organic fields. Um, at our, our research plots, actually, where um, or and nearby where rye has been um, recently incorporated, and we've actually been able to see the, the flies around the field, kind of because we know what they look like. You know, they're kind of swarming, but they're very, very small. So there really isn't um, a lot of other indicators that you can use other than the degree days. You may or may not see flies uh, right after. You know, so don't. I wouldn't want you to expect that you plow in a cover crop and you're going to see all these little swarms of flies coming. Um, you know, that can happen. It has happened to me once in an organic field. Um, but the degree day is really the basic um, unit and way to kind of progress through this and predict, is the 50% peak emergence happening in the area? And if it is, then, you know, that's peak flight. And you can certainly still till in your cover crop at that time, but planting right then, um, immediately after tillage, for example, you know, that would tell you that you're planting during peak egg laying. Um, so that's a really long answer to say that, no, there really isn't anything else to look for. Um, it's the degree days are a proxy. They're a proxy for what the insect is doing. Again, it's so small and it's below ground. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question about harlequin beetles, um, whether you've had any problems with them, and if so, how you've managed them. This person's had it huge problem with them from August until late fall. OK. Um, the question uh, about harlequin beetles, this is Eileen again. And I, um, I asked Christine if in her vegetable cropping system she's seen that. And she has, has not. Um, in our field crops, we have not in our, our cropping system. So I'm looking around the room. Um, and we, we really haven't, uh, we don't have any um, anything to address that. You know, in field crops, it's not as much of an issue. And certainly in vegetable crops, Christine is saying she hasn't seen it as standard process. But okay. thank you. OK, we have another question. Um, I'm not sure who this was for. Um, if, is there any evidence for the pesticide use of compost heat? Okay. So, I, that? I, can, start? I can start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, um, the pesticide. Um, you know, a compost tea preparation. Um, again, that's not something that we're using in our, um, you know, our, our grain cropping system. So I do not have, you know, any information at this time on that. Robin has been an organic vegetable grower in the past, and, and he looks like he has a couple words to, to contribute on that. Yeah, I've, I, I've tried it myself as an organic farmer, and I've also read some papers about it. There certainly is research out there about it. Um, I think. I'm going to try and be careful about what I say. I think the take-home message from the research is ambiguity. Um, and I think there's a, a big issue is uh, how much are you filtering the tea such that you know if you're applying it and you get some pest suppressive effect, is that because there's something that's really in the liquid? Or is it because you just applied a bunch of solid materials to your plants and there's some kind of physical deterrent? I mean, people here in alfalfa, Eileen is actually doing uh, research with another graduate student of hers that involves, among other things, applying manure to alfalfa fields. And it may be that the manure has some kind of physical deterrence on leaf hoppers, which is what they're looking at. Um, so compost tea, is it, a, is it a physical effect, or is it a nutrient effect, or is it some unknown thing? I mean, manure is really complicated. And when you ferment it or distill it to make tea, you're creating even more complicated organic compounds. So some studies have found that it has a, a suppressive effect on one pest or another. Others have found no effect whatsoever. And the ones that have found it, I have not seen anyone convincingly both 
find that effect and demonstrate a mechanism by which it happened. You know, did it was it a nutrient effect that such that the plant applying it to the plant uh, foliarly or to the soil actually changed the plant's production of defensive compounds or something? Or was it purely because you put the material on the outside of the plant? I, I don't know that yet. Maybe someone's done that work, but if they have, I haven't seen it. Okay. Um, let's see. This question is for Robin. Um, what form of calcium is used and what kind of fertilizer that has calcium is used to increase the calcium and magnesium? Um, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, we started out uh, using uh, calcitic limestone, finely powdered calcitic ag lime, um, and then, but we didn't actually want to change our pH. The pHs in our soils turned out to be fine in a good range for production, so we very quickly switched to gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. Um, calcium sulfate, as you may know, does not, uh, does not raise soil pH. You need to have the carbonate in, in calcium carbonate or calcium magnesium carbonate to do that. So calcium sulfate, really the only, the only uses for it in agriculture that I'm aware of are either to provide sulfur, if, for example, you're growing alfalfa and your soils are sulfur deficient, or if you want to try to affect calcium-magnesium ratios, then it's, it's a source of, uh, of it, it's, it's relatively soluble in water compared to ag lime. Um, and so you can put it on, and it dissolves gradually in, in rain as the rain falls um, and moves through your soil. I, in the long run, most of it ends up getting washed out. Which of those you choose to use? Um, ag lime does also potentially change your cation ratios. It depends on what's available in your areas. In, in your area, some in some places, gypsum is very expensive because it has to be imported. We have to import it here in southern Wisconsin. In other places, uh, gypsum is cheap. Um, same for, for either um, calcitic lime or dolomitic lime. Uh, dolomitic limestone is calcium magnesium carbonate. Um, it, it depends on what you've got. You could use any of them. If, if you're using dolomitic limestone, then it, it comes with a calcium to magnesium ratio in it, and so it's, it's less clear um, what kind of ratio you're going to end up with in the soil. If you're using either calcitic limestone or gypsum, then you're more likely to uh, be able, as long as they're finely powdered, to be able to change your ratios. But again, the, the amounts we've been using are big, so I like to warn people about that. In a lot of other similar studies in the field, um, including one done in Iowa several years ago, people have really not successfully changed their ratios at all, which is kind of a precursor for, look, a precondition for looking for insect effects. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, the next couple of questions are about degree days. We have several questions about them. Um, the first one is from, um, let's, let's see, are degree days set for all pest insects, and do insects change their life cycle patterns so that degree days might change depending on the species and region? Um, so the first part of that question, are, as I, I believe I'm repeating this back right, are insect degree days set for all insects? Is mm -hmm. that right, Alice? Yeah. So. Um, they are not set for all insects, but many common um, economic insect pests, we have, you know, there's probably hundreds of insects that degree days are set for. And the way that they're set is um, actually um, uh, an entomologist or a researcher would have to develop a, a phenology model for that particular insect. And what that would involve, um, and I just speak about this, I did this in uh, California during a my master's degree on stink bugs in processing tomatoes when I worked there with uh, Campbell Soup Company. Um, and what we had to do to get a degree day model for this particular stink bug was we actually had to take you know, a large number of insects and we would raise them at a bunch of different temperatures. We actually, researchers have to determine that lower develop developmental threshold. And then you track development at all the different, you know, a wide range of temperatures and then you develop a model based on that. So that's um, how it's done. And then um, once a phenology model is set, because again, you need to know that lower developmental threshold, um, below that temperature, the insect doesn't develop, and above that, it does. So basically, researchers will take a wide range of temperatures, obviously not too cold <laughs> that it'll kill the insects, or too hot that it'll kill the insects, and kind of test all the points in between there. And then they'll get this degree day model and then you can calculate degree days. So if you 
are, for example, in California at the UCIPM website or here in Wisconsin um, at UW-Madison. One of my slides, I gave you a, um, a uh, web address where you could go in and calculate degree days. And in there, you go to that website and you'll find, um, you know, several insect pests, so European corn borer and different uh, insects that do have degree days. Um, as long as you know that lower developmental threshold and have some usually extension information of how to apply that information. Um, so not all, you know, any insect that is important in crop management that people have developed a phenology model for, yes, there are degree days for. And it's going to depend on the website that you're working with and some websites around the country and different universities, land-grant universities, you will be able to find the exact pest you're looking for. Other ones, um, you will have to know the lower developmental threshold, and then you can work on it from there. So, um, but there are certainly many insects that there's no degree days for. But I think they're developed because and when they're important in crop management. And the second part of the question, Alice? Um, well, let me just go back to the first part because it goes to another question that we're getting. Is, um, can you um, okay. repeat a couple recommendations of which websites people might go to to find that kind of information or like any kind of online calculator or other website sure. that has information about degree days? Yes. Um, I have um, actually, I have a, a sheet of paper that I'm just asking. Rob, could you bring me that? Sorry. I have that right here. The um, Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think one good source that I have used frequently in the past is, um, so I'll give just two examples, one from California and one from Wisconsin right off the top of my head. But in California, um, it's UC IPM, and um, you could just Google UC IPM, and they, you can search on that website. There are phenology model databases, and they have many different pests. Um, here in Wisconsin, um, the examples that we have are, um, well, this is kind of a long website, but it's, um, you know, Alice, it, it's a very long website that yeah, I have Yeah, what here. we can do, actually, is we can yeah. post the name of it. If you just give us the name of it, sure. um, if it's from the University of Wisconsin, and then what we can do is we can post these resources on the page with the webinar okay. recording after the webinar. And the recording will be available within the next week, but we can post the resources um, later today. So okay. if you go to think, um, the eOrganic yeah. homepage, which is on your screen right now, and then you look under archived webinars in about an hour okay. or so, we'll be able to post those yeah. resources if we get them from Eileen. So, um, yeah, look for those that. later today. Yeah, yeah that'd be great because it's hard to read I'll, a long I'll address look. online. We have a couple more yeah. minutes here. Um, so let me just sure. go back to the rest of that question. But thanks. Yeah. Um, do species change their life cycle pattern so that degree days might change depending on the species and region? No, that's what's, uh, well, I guess to an entomologist, that's what's kind of neat about it is that um, a heat unit is a heat unit. So it really doesn't matter where that insect species is. Um, you know, we don't see insects developing different biotypes to different temperature regions and that. Um, so, you know, if you have a, a seed corn maggot here in Wisconsin and it's a really cold spring, it's just going to take that much longer for it to accumulate those heat units. It's not going to change its life cycle. It's not going to, it really can't outwit or work around. It requires those certain number of heat units. If we have a warmer spring, that means those pupa are going to produce flies more quickly and earlier in the season. So so that's a really great question. It's kind of like, you know, it's, a, it's like a law of nature. Those heat units have to be met and they have to be accumulated for that insect. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question because we do have other insect pests that you look at something like, for example, western corn rootworm in parts of the, the uh, Midwest here um, that has been able to develop, uh, change its behavior to um, become you know, resistant to crop rotation, which is a non-chemical control. But with degree days, nope, the, the insect really can't, can't do anything around that. They, they really have to get those heat units to go through their life stage. I might okay. add just one, one little thing that is, I have found kind of interesting. It's maybe not too important, but there are, I've learned recently that there are a few insects that are guided into their development not just by uh, temperature, but also by day length and that can actually um, sometimes can be forced to move through their, through their life stages by day length um, even more so than temperature. So if you're, in a, if you're relatively far north in the northern hemisphere, then uh, ladybugs late in the season, for example, you can collect 
a thousand multicolored Asian lady beetles, which in Wisconsin is unfortunately not hard to do. And uh, you, if you look at them, some of them are much bigger than others, and that's apparently because the, the, the little ones were forced by the shortening day length to, um, to move between one larval stage and the next uh, when they were smaller than they would otherwise have been. Yep. Uh, but day, length, day length is another proxy for, for insect development. Right. That's right. Good point. Okay. Um, for past, past it, it's not that important. Okay, let's... Uh, Sorry, Alice. Oh, that's okay. That's hard one. We're all in different locations here. Um, do any of the three presenters see a role that the buffer zone can play as either a reservoir for beneficial insects or for pest insects that migrate into the cropland? If so, how can the role of the buffer be enhanced? Well, I'm just wondering um, if, Christine, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know that you've been using trap crops. And do you have any well, comments on that? Um, at home, our, our farm is very low in, um, in a marsh. And so we are enrolled in the NRCS um, CREP program. So all of our fields are surrounded by CREP strips which is um, really, to me, an ideal buffer. And at work, we have um, extensive buffers um, just to protect ourselves from conventional neighbors and so forth. And I don't, in 17 years, we've never lost a crop at home to an insect, um, nor at work. So I'm thinking they're beneficial. I have buffers everywhere. <laughs> and there's a good amount of research. I know that. Um I believe Doug Landis's group out of Michigan State University and, and many others have done um, this kind of work of buffers as natural enemy um, enhancement and attractant. But um, yeah, you know, in our particular system, where we haven't done anything with the buffers, for example, in the large field experiment that Robin's working on, as you saw in that photograph, they're basically simply you know um, grass alleyways. But there are farming systems that really develop those more for natural enemy uh, enhancement. I've seen uh, research from Europe in particular where people have created what they call beetle banks, which are, are, are grassed field edges which host predatory beetles that move out into the field um, and do, in some systems, a really important or useful job of pest control. Um, I don't know if Eileen would second this assessment. I think here it depends a lot on exactly what's in your border. If you have, you know, you need to be potentially providing resources, so flower, you know, nectar and pollen to have predators. And I think people have done a lot with that, particularly in high value crops like, like vineyards in California. Here in the Midwest, um, I think a problem is that we tend to have very big fields and very small edges. So any edge, piece of edge that you have is very far from potentially at least the middle of a field. So. I think people, including uh, a researcher here at UW, Claudio Graton, and the Landis Group in Michigan, have found that increasing the amount of landscape that's in something other than row crops is helpful in general, but uh, in terms of very particular recommendations for how much, how wide your strips should be and what should be in them, I'm not sure we're prepared to make those statements. Thank you, Robin. That's a good point. And you know, Christine's system at Standard Process, Christine, you mentioned you know you have. I think you said 21 different crops, and you have a much different ratio of edges to, to fields than we do in our large experiment. Correct, and um, I think we, we have a cover crop on every field at least once a year, some of it early, some of it middle season, some of it late. And um, we use a lot of chickling vetch, but the bursium and crimson clovers um, are always usually blooming and certainly attract a lot of beneficials, in my opinion. OK, uh, let's see. One more question here. Can you explain the effects of rolling the cover crops compared to incorporating covers um, to control the seed corn maggot? Sure. Um, and actually, thanks for that question. That will be in um, uh, this uh, organic seed corn maggot management fact sheet. Um, so in the literature, as we've reviewed it to prepare the fact sheet, um, the incorporation is a bit more attractive to the seed corn maggots. And that makes sense if you think about it, because um, incorporating, actually breaking down the plant material a little bit more, um, getting more decomposing plant volatiles. Um, the rolling or crimping, it relatively, is a little bit less attractive. Um, however, you know, I'm sure others have seen this too. I mean, I have um, seen fields with um, colleagues here um, that have had a rolled 
cover crop and of rye and have had you know pretty significant sea corn maggot damage. So it's just a relative scale, but that full incorporation where you're really breaking down that plant material, that would be a little bit more um, attractive to the sea corn maggot. And um, there's a little bit in the literature that we've reviewed um, that legumes can be a bit more attractive than grasses. Um, but again, you can certainly see sea corn maggot in a, in a crimped rye, you know, no-till field. But, it, but hopefully that answers it. So in a nutshell, um, incorporating is more attractive and legumes may be a little bit more attractive than grass. Okay, um, here's a question about whether or not you can recommend any good resources for trap crop information. Um, this listener is from Northern California, but um, maybe you can recommend some general good trap crop information for different places? Well, um, well, just kind of looking at each other, I think that might be one that um, I could pull together and post with the degree day, you know, the heat unit, uh, insect degree day um, example for the okay. resources I know. And some of the places I'm going to go to look for that, for example, I know that Cornell University has put out a very nice um, pest management, organic pest management um, resource. So I don't off the top of my head again, but and it'd be interesting if that's more, you know, if this person is asking more from vegetable perspective. But I can certainly just, you know, go through and, and post some resources that hopefully will be helpful. Okay, yeah, we'll post those resources. We'll get as many as we can today, and we'll post them um, as soon as we can after the webinar. Somebody said that um, the University of California link wasn't working, so we'll make sure we get that correctly put up there. We'll check yeah. it and um, post it on um, our Great. website, which will be the archived webinar page for this webinar. If you just go to the um, extension.org slash organic production, you go down to archived webinars, and then we'll have this webinar there, and then we'll post as much of that information as we can. Um, we are running out of time, but I'd like to thank you all for your questions. And as I mentioned before, if you have additional questions, I'd like to invite you to use the Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask. And um, this recording will be posted in the following week. And thank you so much for coming today, Christine, Eileen, and Robin. And thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you very much. much.